can't be the whole audience, but come do it. Please. Come on, guys. I'm shy. Come on. Uh, Barbara, while, while, we're, while they're walking down, yes. can, I, can I start things off maybe sure. with, the, with the first question? Um, how did you get involved with this with this project? I mean, how did it start? It seems like, I mean, seeing the personality of Natalie and, and how uh, passionate she is about what she does, it seems like a great fit for you. I mean, how did, how did this all happen? Uh, well, Cecilia Peck and I decided that we wanted to do a film on the Dixie Chicks. And this was even before they made the statement. And they went, no, no. And then they had a website crew with them that captured the statement, thank goodness. And we went back to them and said, now can we make a film about you? And we had a whole discussion with them. They looked at our other films and they said, you're on. And they let us do it. What a, yeah, what an amazing... Um Oh, uh, guys, your chickens, come on up here. Right. There are come some on. people up here, so, uh, so Barbara, why don't you, come on up. Why don't I'm, you uh, I'm introduce... I'm going to let them introduce themselves and what they did. Right, Bob Eisenhardt, I was one of the editors on the film. <laughs> I'm one of the co-editors and many, many associate editors and co-editors. <laughs> I'm David Cassidy. I was a producer on this film. <laughs> I'm Mike Silva. I was... Uh, Co-editor. Judy Lynn Dixon, I was the uh, assistant editor. Craig Heimson, and I was an associate producer. Joe Bolt, production assistant. I think this might be the largest. The shyest group. Oh, this is. Here. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Well, 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 who has a question in the audience that they would like to ask that they're burning to ask? Anything. Uh, I have one right over here. Yeah, I noticed that you played around with times. I went from 2003 to 2005. It's fixed. Anyway, I just wonder if you talk a little bit about that. Um, well, I think I'll let one of the editors talk about it. I mean, we tried to do a linear structure, but it just felt flat. But I think, why don't one of the editors talk? I see Jane running away. Come on, Jane. Yeah, I, I think uh, all of the, all the editors felt, had a gut feeling that it couldn't be told chronologically. Uh, but we kind of had to prove it to ourselves. And for the longest time, going back and forth in time, didn't work. It was very confusing, and it was very hard to find the right jumping off point that sent you backward. So about three times during the process, we strung it together chronologically to look at it. And it made it for about 30 minutes, and then it was, everybody fell asleep. <laughs> uh, so I, I, we finally got the time passages to work, and it was just a question of getting the right moment to loop back, and the right graphics, and the right pacing. cards around and looking at them and then arguing about whether it would work or not. Right, and as always, um, there were certain things that, you know, we wanted in and certain things that other people didn't, and we were working with so many um, different editors and so many different sensibilities, but the discussions that we had were sensational because you just couldn't say, no, you had to explain how it moved the story forward or what it gave the characters. And so it was very egalitarian in the editing room. Uh, question right here. So it's such a, such a well-edited film, but it's also such a great verite film. And I'm curious, I imagine you spent had to spend so much time with them. And I'm curious about that and how your relationship developed with the women, the three women of the film. Well, I think for me, the three women were so amazing. They were about transformation. They were about courage. They were about sisterhood. It's sort of for, I really wanted to have friends exactly like the Dixie Chicks because they were there for each other for all the big moments. And the 
wonderful part of it is that most of the time we could just be there filming and they just went about their lives and they were in so much crisis or trying to write their songs or having babies or hmm. whatever they were doing that we were totally unimportant and they just allowed us to film. So it was very good. But Natalie does speak her mind <laughs> all the time. <laughs> Did they ever and like get it. mad at you? Did they ever get frustrated with you? Um, well, I think the heaviest thing was when they came to see the film for the first time because we didn't let them see anything until the film was in fine cut. And I'll never forget it. Um, it was my birthday, actually. <laughs> and we got wine and we got things for them to eat, but probably not enough wine. <laughs> and so they came in and they were looking at it and um, it was in Bob's uh, editing room and we were watching them watch the film. And it wasn't as if after the film they went, oh, that was so great or we really loved it. It was as if they were watching their lives go by and remembering all those painful things and their body reactions were all doing different things. And I remember that Natalie had never heard Marty say that she would give up her career for her. And so when she heard that, you know, she touched her leg. And I think it brought them together, but I think they were really freaked out seeing the film. It was as if somebody had really climbed into their souls and exposed so much about them. Did, did you think about filming them watching the film a la <laughs> no, that, that would have been too hard. <laughs> no, we didn't. <laughs> Questions um, over here. How did you decide like when to stop filming and start editing? Because I was surprised that um, the big, you know, Grammy suite, which to me I would have thought that would be, you know, that that's their fuck you to ever, the whole industry. And, and I was just surprised that it, it wasn't in there. And like, was that a conscious decision, or was that a regret of not telling them to? Uh, no, I mean I think we said what we wanted to say, but. You know, as filmmakers, we always want to put everything in. But the film had been finished by then. Okay. And we just cheered from the sidelines <laughs> for the first time and sort of enjoyed the moment of them being able to say, screw you to everybody. Actually, we, we did film a whole other concert. We, we, yeah, we thought we it was important to, to see them coming back to the United States, not just saying that we're in London. And so there's a fairly weak shoot about uh, Detroit, yeah. yeah. And we took one look at it and said, no. the other scene has all the emotion in it, yeah. and, and we didn't use it. Uh, right here. Uh, yeah, during the, the uh, segment in Dallas, what mm -hmm. was the, what was the, we could see what the, the mood uh, uh, with the d girls was, but what was the mood uh, on the, uh, on the, with the crew? Um, well, I, I think that um, we didn't film that, the website group filmed that. So I can only guess, but I know that Marty and Emily were petrified for the Dallas, and they moved apart from Natalie. <laughs> so Just she was probably sort of standing yeah. on the stage, and they were at the far side of either <laughs> stage. I think they were really, really scared. And, and that was probably um, not intentional. <laughs> well, I don't know. I, I don't know. <laughs> <laughs> there was so much at stake for all of them with their families and the people that love them, but they did it. They did it. Yeah, and that, that's one of the, there's so many emotional uh, moments in the film, and that moment when Natalie is kind of almost like she's marching into battle as she walks down the hallway onto the stage. You know, she says nothing, but it's so powerful. Just to oh. see, like, I mean, she, her shoulders are hunched forward. Well, and also the really beautiful part of that was her husband, Adrian, you know, was there and just hugged her. And he, was, he didn't really travel with her that much, but for this particular one, he came because he just wanted to be there for her. Uh, I think there was a testimony. Yes. Well, we knew Adrian really well. 
um, he had lived in New York, and he would always tell us stories about the Dixie Chicks and how fascinating they were. And then Cecilia, who was very friendly also with Adrian, started sort of hanging out with the Dixie Chicks. And then she called me and she said, come on, we've got to do this. And we just thought that they were fascinating creatures. I mean, they weren't political then. They were doing country music. It was looking into a space that, you know, we had never seen before and never looked at before. And, you know, and then it evolved to such a total transformation and doing unbelievable creative work. Uh, um, well, maybe some, you can comment on some things you know, and Barry. Can. Well, actually, when uh, Robert approached me about working on this project, um, he said, I, I'm still with Rebecca at home, so I said, you know what, I'm good to hear. <laughs> I said, I never heard of it. <laughs> <laughs> not one single song. I mean, it's, I'm not a country music, and by the end of the film, I bought at least five albums. <laughs> um, this film was a significant collaborative effort, and it took two and a half years of everyone in this room's life that worked on it, and this is like a family reunion. I have such a warm feeling in this room right now, and I can't believe how many people. It was five years next month that we premiered this film at the Toronto Film Festival, and it's like a little family reunion. I can't believe some of the faces we're seeing, and everyone's like, hey, how you doing? And we're shaking hands, because that's what this film was like, and I think that in five more years, hopefully we'll all get together and it'll feel the same exact way. And uh, this will be that film that every five years, I think that the people that worked on this will get back together and say, I am so proud to have my name at the end of it because that's how I feel. And it just feels so good to be in this room with all these people right now. Yeah. How has the reception to the film been in, in the country music world? <laughs> well, we thought that this film was going to show, you know, in so many cities and really show theatrically in a lot of different places. And it did show in some, but there was also in certain areas it was never shown. But the interesting thing is that the Weinstein Company, who distributed the film, um, did focus groups at the very beginning. And they did it in New York, and they did it in, I think it was Kansas. And it got the highest reviews that the Weinstein Company had ever gotten. Even in Kansas during that time, they didn't like the politics so much but they really loved the Dixie Chicks and they loved their families and wanted to see more of it. So I think if people went to see it, it touched them. I remember in Washington, D.C., one of the right-wing Sparkle group members was in the audience and he started you know, saying things before the film. And so after the film, I called him up and asked him to please be on the panel with me so that everybody in the audience could really get a sense of, you know, why he felt the way he felt. And he blogged and he wrote the way he did about the Dixie Chicks. And at the end of the film, he got up there and he said, you know, I really love this film. <laughs> and he said, I shouldn't be saying this, but I really love it. And for me, I guess it's just getting out there and showing it and really being able to communicate with people. People fear what they don't know and what they don't understand. Uh, over here. Do you think the uh, change in the, the political winds from 03 to 06 either affected uh, how you edited the movie or uh, how the movie was, um, I guess, promoted uh, to audiences? Well, I think. I mean, you could speak to this, Bob, or Jane, or whatever, but um, I think we just wanted to make a good movie. And we used all the themes that we thought would do that. I think the distribution company, um, the Weinstein company, wanted to make it more political. 
and at the very end when it was decided that they were going to distribute it they in fact asked us to put in a few political pundits and you know it was a war but we put in a few political pundits but so that was as far as it got because I think that the Weinstein company really thought this film would get the Republicans out of you know office and do things and we just thought that this was a film that was about freedom of speech it was about sisterhood it was about you know feeling betrayed and it had so many larger universal issues that it was about I don't know if you want to add yeah when we first started the project we were actually in the beginning of shooting the making of the album so there were 500 hours of the first 2003 shoot we have no idea what was in the footage so we have to really you know come through every single frame and we didn't know that they know what's being said it's called pump film we didn't know that until we discovered the cutting room <laughs> so you know we, I mean we just went in the audience we couldn't do this <laughs> you could barely hear the statement it was shocking that they actually captured it I mean he's it was a great gift to have the 600 hours of footage I don't know what we would have done without it because these guys were there all the time and the chicks really loved them because they like pressed themselves up against the wall and they were in the corners and didn't bother the chicks at all they they got all that stuff, that meeting after the, in the hotel room in London and stuff, it's just, it was amazing stuff. But for me, in the end, it's, it wasn't about the politics, it really was about the friendship. Uh, I, and for, so now, the political landscape has changed so much, it's, it's strange seeing the involvement in that moment, but what stayed with me was the, was the sisterhood. Maybe one, one or two more questions um, over here. Tell us more about any interesting stories about shooting with Ruben and the Weasel character. <laughs> I love the dog. What was Rick Ruben like? He's very shy, camera shy, and laid down on the couch a lot. <laughs> and, <laughs> no. At prayer meetings, uh, refused to help him. Meetings. Yeah, I had Latte, his dog. Um, no, nothing outstanding other than he has the golden touch with so many groups and seems like everybody he works with become, you know, mega stars and their albums do so incredibly well. And we weren't really able to capture his magic, but I'm sure it's there. I'm wondering if you can talk a little more about, about the dynamic between the three women. I mean, obviously, Natalie is such a presence and such a force, but I found Marty to be quite a presence as well. And there's that one scene where they have that kind of strange sort of like coded conversation about resenting the band leader. And I wonder if that was a theme throughout. Like, was Marty sort of jealous or resentful or didn't think Natalie was always the best front person? Was that at all there? Well, I think the, the, if there was a conflict, I think it was more about the kind of music that they were going to play. I think that Natalie really wanted to go more into rock, and Emily and Marty, country just meant everything to them. And they were a little nervous, I think, when uh, Rick Rubin came into the picture and were trying to figure out where they were in all of this and trying to preserve what they did best. They subsequently went on to do an album together, correct? Uh, yes. The uh, Natalie um, is trying was trying for a while to find herself, <laughs> and um, Marty and Emily just did a country album maybe about six or eight months ago, where they were singing and playing just the two of them together. Courtyard Hounds. Yeah, Courtyard Hounds is the name of the group. Any more questions? Can I ask a final question? Um, you know, this is a great film and it's a great story and there are great characters, uh, but when, when did you know that you had something special? Or at one point in a project, you know, it's like you just, you get have this gut feeling. Uh, well, the film went through, as the editors talked about it, sometimes we didn't know that. And sometimes we were wondering you know, were audiences ever going to really look at this? And then, I don't know, suddenly it started to come together. And it really leapt off the screen, and we felt we had the right structure and the right dynamic. And 
it, it was just magic. I mean, we loved it. So we knew if we loved it, maybe somebody else would. Um, I think maybe, we, any, any more questions from the audience? <laughs> oh, Ruth? A lot of films that could be considered music films, but I, I never think of them as music films. I mean, we did Woodstock now and then. We did a film um, called Wild Man Blues about Woody Allen and his jazz band. Um, many films that contained a lot of music, but I don't look at this as a music film. I look at it as, you know, what Bob was saying. It's about sisterhood. It's about friendship. It's it's so many of the universal themes that we all care about that it goes far beyond being a music film. I don't think that we've ever really done a music film because there's always stories attached and there's human elements attached. I don't know. I don't think so. There's any weird elements here. Um, well, we keep talking about the, the, the concept of and how fortunate as filmmakers can we be to have three extremely talented women who are trying to figure out what they just went through and to uh, find catharsis through um, their art. And thank goodness they are so talented because they did find peace. And how fortunate we are that we can have such a brilliant ending because that comment from Natalie, I mean from uh, Marty that Barbara spoke about before is just, every time I start to tear up a little bit because it's just such a powerful statement. Um, and I've seen it dozens upon dozens of times, and it just really brings us to the, all the way home. And uh, every time I think about the music, I just think about what went into the writing process. And thankfully, it's just not three women with pens and papers, but they're really trying to figure out what they just went through and who they're going to be at the end of it. Well done. <laughs> well, I think that's a perfect note to end our conversation with, our official conversation. I should add that an unofficial conversation will continue across the street, next to McDonald's, at a place called Three Sheets to the Wind. Um, so come over and have a, have a drink, and I think Barbara will entertain questions, uh, nope. maybe. If I'll be Three Sheets to the Wind. Three Sheets to the Wind. Uh, and before we, we say goodnight, I, uh, I encourage you guys to um, stay tuned for details.